I can't believe I've made it to the final episode of Attack on Titan. I've never read the manga, so I don't have any idea how they're going to wrap things up in one episode. But they've told us this is the final season, so I'm sure it's going to end today with this episode. I wouldn't be so sure of that, Sonny. So this final episode of part two of the final season, but not the final part of the final season, well, it started out with some wide-eyed fun. And this fun had just been missing for so long. And I think I didn't even realize how much I had missed that fun. But when we see all of these like flashbacks and these memories of the first time that the, the group that we got to know so well in parody made their way to Marley, it just was like this breath of fresh air that I didn't even know I was suffocating without. It was so nice to get it, but at the same time it hurt because I know that we're probably not going to get much more of this going forward. And of course, at the center of all this fun was Sasha. And it just draws us so much more to the idea that once Sasha died, a lot of the fun and a lot of the levity in this show died with her. So it's great to see these flashbacks with her here again, because I didn't know if we'd ever get to see her again. But also, it's kind of heart-wrenching knowing how her story ends. But just seeing her and Connie kind of running around being crazy, they get worked up to trying to like feed carrots to a car because they see a car go by and they don't know what a car is. Now, Hanji says she's read about it before, but they think maybe it's some kind of horse. And then I think Sasha's convinced it's a cow and they're off to try to feed the car carrots. Of course, I don't think they succeed, or at least if they did, it's not shown on camera. But I would love to see like, how, how do you try to feed a carrot to a car? Do you like shove it through the front grill? or in the gas tank or up the tailpipe. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities on how to try to feed a carrot to a car, but none of them seem real good ideas to me. And then there's just so much joy in the discovery of ice cream for this group. Like Sasha in particular, once again, all of the fun in this initial half of the episode with the joyful flashback seems to be centered around Sasha and with her wide eyes that she looks at the world and her discovery and the joy she gets from the ice cream. I mean, that is also one of the more fun moments here. She tastes the ice cream. She loves it immediately. It's cold. She's not expecting it to be cold, but she goes nuts for it. Even Jean gets in on the ice cream game a little bit, and we have a lot of fun with that discovery too. But then, almost out of nowhere, everybody's enjoying ice cream, and somebody offers a lollipop to Levi. And it turns out to be this creepy clown. And this creepy clown, who thinks Levi's a little boy, by the way, he asks him if he's in one of those little boy gangs, because he's dressed up and we know that Levi is short. That makes it even creepier that this clown is trying to give candy to a strange little boy and whispering in his ear. Like, I don't know if this is John Wayne Gacy creepy or if this is Pennywise creepy, but no doubt this creepy clown is probably the scariest, creepiest thing we've seen so far in Attack on Titan. I mean, we have like 30 meter tall giants that have all their skin peeled off so you can see their muscles. Not as creepy as this clown. You had Rod Rice in his Titan form that looked like a giant slug and even got the front of his face sliced off where you could see like his nasal passages and his sinuses still not as creepy as this clown whispering in Levi's ear and I gotta say I was kind of hoping Levi might give that clown a black eye or something but it looks like the clown in all of its royal creepiness managed to escape the encounter with Levi unscathed but I kind of think they need to make a spinoff series. I've heard people talk about some possible sequel series or spinoff series to Attack on Titan. I want to see Creepy Clown Chronicles because I want to see what the heck the deal is with this creepy clown because you know it's not good. You know this is the one guy who's up to something even creepier than Zachary's butt chugging. And I am not a fan of clowns. Using this clown sparingly was a beautiful stroke of creepy genius in this episode because wow, I wasn't expecting it and I'll never forget it. And I'm afraid to go to sleep tonight because I'm gonna close my eyes and I'm gonna see that clown whispering in my ear. But when they're all having this joy with the ice cream, did Aaron ever taste it? I know they offered some of the ice cream to Aaron and then he got lost in like this reverie because he had memories courtesy of his father from when he you know, took the attack Titan of the fact that people in Liberia and the people in the Eldian zones around the world don't get ice cream very often. And it brought down the joy in this somber, melancholy moment. But there's a part of me that wonders like if Aaron had actually taken a taste of that ice cream 
Could it maybe have lifted his spirits and changed the whole trajectory of this show? Like, is that one of the moments? I mean, there's another moment in this show that's probably more likely to have been able to change the trajectory of Aaron. But I wonder how things would have been different if he would have tasted the ice cream. He would have loved it, got his own cone with a triple scoop or something, and just started chowing down on ice cream. And he used all of his Titan powers to build a gigantic ice cream factory. And he brought the world together by giving everyone free ice cream. Because how could you hate the devils from parody if they bring you free ice cream like every couple of weeks? He could have solved all of this conflict, potentially, with ice cream. But I don't think he tasted the ice cream. And well, we know how bleak things got after that. And we do meet this refugee boy who's kind of fun. He's like this pickpocket. He steals Sasha's purse. Levi, you know, being always sly, having his eyes on the lookout all the time, catches the kid, gets the purse back. But then we see the mob confront him. And we see the mentality of the mob and their opinion towards outsiders. And they immediately, when they think this is a thief or this is someone they don't like, their immediate xenophobia also extends to saying he's probably an Eldian. And we do see how the mob turns against him and how the mob wants to essentially murder this child as an example for simply, you know, trying to make his way in the world. Granted, being a thief is not something you want to encourage, but he's just a kid. He doesn't necessarily know any better. He's had a pretty rough time to go here. And this mentality of the mob, you can understand how like this same kind of thought process is a microcosm of the parody island problem and the Eldian problem. And it's all expressed here. And we do get to see like another person who's having sort of a parallel experience to what these folks from parody are experiencing. However, he has none of the power or none of the ability to maybe fight back like they do. And then also surrounding the conversation with that, that young boy, the refugee, there's lots of talk about blood tests and more and more blood tests are being developed in order to detect if someone is Eldian. And I think this is interesting because I wonder how the blood tests are applied. Like does every single person get a blood test in some of these countries or do they only give the blood tests to people that they want to be Eldian. You know what I'm saying there? Like maybe they selectively choose. If you're a criminal, they give you a blood test. They can claim you're Eldian whether you are or not. Like is this some kind of a, a gimmick or something that's maybe being used for political purposes in order to persecute your enemies or people you don't agree with more than it's truly scientific? Like I'm kind of curious about these blood tests and how well they work. We know that Kruger managed to circumvent the blood test somehow. We saw that back in one of the prior seasons. But just hearing about this emergence of more and more blood tests is very concerning because you start to wonder, like, how accurate are they? If they have false positives, how do you, like, argue for yourself? If you have three blood tests and one is positive and two is negative, do they still assume that you're Eldian? Like, this does raise a lot of questions, not to mention in some corrupt governments or something, maybe the blood test wouldn't even be real. They would just use it politically. Kind of concerning, kind of, you know, interesting with emerging medicine and science in this world, like what's going on here with the blood tests and I guess it's better than an alternative which is stab everybody with spinal fluid and see who turns into a titan and who doesn't that would be really bad but we get this moment where Aaron and Mikasa are alone on this hilltop and Aaron asks Mikasa what am I to you and this does really feel like the turning point. Like I had a little bit of fun with the ice cream and said tasting the ice cream could have been a turning point for Aaron where things may have gone in a different direction, may have had a different trajectory. But here, this really does feel like a pivotal moment. And when he asks Mikasa, what am I to you? Well, she thinks about it. She doesn't feel confident in her answer. Like she wants to give the answer that Aaron wants to hear, I think. But at the same time, she's nervous about giving the wrong answer. I don't think she necessarily gives a dishonest answer, but I don't think it's a wholly honest answer either. But she says, you're like family. And that seems to not be the answer that Aaron wanted to hear. But I also don't know exactly what Aaron wanted to hear. Like, first off, I don't think he wanted an answer that involved romance specifically, though romance could have been one aspect to it. But I see this relationship between them as unconditional love that is stronger or goes beyond just simply romance. I don't know what answer he wanted. I mean, he only has four years left to live. Maybe he's looking for that answer family because he knows that he's had family that he's been strong enough to turn his back on before. 
But if she said, you're more than family, you're my best friend, you're part of me in a way that I can't explain, then it would have been harder for him to maybe turn his back on her, which we know he's not really turning his back, but he's like trying to chase her off from him so she won't mourn him when he's gone and once he does what he has to do in order to make her life better. He wants her to be happy in the future. And maybe by hearing her say that he's like family, that gives him the confidence to know that when, he, when, when family dies, it hurts, but we move on. And maybe that answer tells him he can go forward with this plan that's been passed to him from his future self and all that sort of thing. But I wonder, what do you think is the answer he wanted to hear? Do you think there was a right answer in this situation? Or do you think the answer she gave was the right answer? Because this one really puzzles me. It feels like such a pivotal point, but I don't know what the other branch would have looked like. What is the answer that would have led to something different? And what would that different outcome have looked like? But we do see another moment of joy. Like we had all the joy when they first got to town and the ice cream and feeding carrots to cars. But then the refugee camp, these people that have almost nothing, they're living in tents, they've lost their homes due to war, they're foreigners in this land, and they just have this open reception to the people from Paradis. They don't treat them any differently. They're welcomed into their homes, these tents. They give them wonderful looking food. I mean, it looks delicious. Plus they got a bottle of clear liquid that looks a lot like vodka to me. I don't know what they're passing around, but they sure seem to be in the party mood once they have a few swigs of that. And it's another moment of joy, and it shows us like an alternative pathway where people from different cultures and different backgrounds, and they've all had their own pain and suffering, but they can still come together and enjoy one another's company. And it's a nice juxtaposition to exactly what's going down between the Eldians and the Marlans, and more specifically between Marley and Parody. And it's, it's so nice and it's so sad at the same time like why couldn't there be more warm receptions like what the refugees are giving to the folks from parody here in their tent city and then there's like this forum i don't know almost like a congress or some sort of body that's getting together to meet and it's like a group that are pro eldian so the folks from parody hanji you know mikasa aaron they all want to go hear what this group has to say because hopefully this pro Eldian group could be somebody that the folks from parody could talk to and try to find some kind of solution to the problem that exists however this guy gets up and his whole point of view the whole thing he's trying to sell he's trying to save the Eldians around the world at the expense of the devils from the island of parody and this lets Aaron know that there's no hope from this group that the hatred goes beyond anything that this group can seem to handle because even the Eldians are willing to turn against those folks of parody, more or less, in order to save the Eldians. And they're painting the Eldians and the rest of the world as victims of the old Eldian Empire, which, of course, their descendants all live on parody. And he walks out of this room with his plan firmly in position. He goes off on his own. That was the last time the group had ever seen him before his declaration of war is what I think the commentary tells us here. But I also wonder if he gets inspiration. Like this guy is trying to use the island of Parody as the villain to get the Marlans and the Eldians, the non-Eldians and Eldians to come together in one group and have a common enemy. And I wonder if he's trying to refine that down even further to make himself and the titans of the rumbling the common enemy so that the people of Parody can be spared while everyone puts all their efforts into working together to stop Aaron and his rumbling, what I've called the Watchmen ending for a few episodes now, and I even did that Watchmen video about Attack on Titan, but I think this is part of his inspiration, is he wants to use some laser-like focus to make the monster that they must fight smaller than the devils on the island of Parody, and just himself and the titans from the walls and the rumbling. And we get some flashbacks from Aaron's perspective after this, and it does shed some light on Aaron's relationship with Flock and Flock's role in the plan, because there was some speculation that I made when Flock is kind of becoming a despot and a dictator, and he's really starting to kind of exert control, and he's saying things like, Aaron told me all about his plan, and I knew it from the beginning. I thought maybe he was lying, and he was just saying that to seize power, but we do see that Aaron did tell him a lot of the plan, though I don't think Aaron told him the whole plan. I do think, though, that Aaron told him, let's pretend like we're going along with Zeke, but I don't think Aaron explained to Flock that he doesn't want to destroy all of civilization outside the island. He wants to create a monster that gets civilization to band together and put their cycle of hate behind them and move forward with a humanity that can be peaceful. I think that, unfortunately, 
sacrifices have to be made. And Aaron has been willing to make some very costly sacrifices. And I think Flock was like a sacrificial lamb that Aaron sent to the slaughter. I think Aaron set Flock up to be this despot and to be another enemy. I think he picked him out because he thought this is a person people could get together on hating. And he abused Flock's loyalty to him in a way. That's what I took away from this meeting. That's what I'm thinking of this interaction. I don't know if we'll ever get any more of Flock's point of view going forward. But seeing this gave me a little bit more sympathy for Flock than I had the last time I saw Flock. And then we also kind of simultaneously with the conversation with Flock and Zeke, we also see Aaron's perspective of a conversation he had with Astoria. And I'm not entirely sure what the takeaway is from Aaron's conversation with Astoria. Like, does she still have a role to play? Because she's been kind of missing from the events of late. But when he has this conversation... They say a lot of things, but one thing Astoria says is, I won't let you do this. But what's she going to do to stop it? We do understand this is when she decided that becoming pregnant would keep her from being turned into a titan so that she would devour Zeke and serve whatever role they wanted her bloodline to play and having her children be servants of the island to control the threat of the rumbling for all eternity. But I still feel like she has something she wants to do or that maybe she thinks she's capable of doing to stop Aaron. I don't even know if that means trying to turn into a Titan and consume Aaron. I don't know if that's still part of her plan. I feel like because we do spend some time in this conversation with Astoria, it gives us more perspective in that she totally does not support what Aaron's doing, but also she says she won't let him do it. He even offers to erase her memory so she doesn't know about it, that she's allowing it, but she refuses that too. So I'm just curious if she still has a, a role to play in the end of this story when we finally get there in 2023, or if this was to sort of put the final bow on her story arc. Like I said to start with, I'm not entirely sure what to take away from Aaron's conversation with Astoria. If you've got thoughts, I'd love to hear them. And then we do see a conversation between Aaron and Zeke that serves to confirm the suspicions that I had, and I'm sure most of you had all along, that Aaron lied to Mikasa about her bond, that Mikasa wasn't just following some Ackerman bond to protect her host. Uh, the things that Zeke says to him is, I think she just likes you enough to kill Titans for you. And Aaron realizes that, and we know that Aaron doesn't feel those awful things he says to Mikasa, but it's like, you know, throwing rocks at your at the dog or the wild animals so that it will leave you and go live with its own kind out in the woods. Or, you know, that's kind of a trope from 60s and 50s books and TV shows and stuff. But you got to get the wild animal to go back in the wild where it belongs because the people in the city are going to kill it. So you act like you hate it. We even saw that in Game of Thrones when... Arya has to chase off Nymeria to go into the woods so Nymeria won't be killed. So it's kind of like that. He really loves Mikasa. He cares very much for Mikasa, but he's got to chase her off for her own good, in his opinion, or her own safety. And this confirms that. That conversation with Zeke really, really was nice to make it clear and unequivocal in the three-step reveal. This is that third step that takes all doubt away from it. And then we also see... This pretty rough scene, or sequence really, more than just one scene, of Aaron's self-mutilation. Now, I understand he's got to look like he has been injured in battle, he's a casualty of war, so he has to have some, some war scars in order to sneak in to Liberio and to be there when he makes his declaration of war and to, to fit in with the other injured soldiers, but also... The way that he's doing it and how visceral it looks when he's cutting his leg off and, and particularly when he takes that bullet and he's ready to gouge his own eye out, it almost feels like self-flagellation. Like he feels like he deserves to be punished for what he's about to do. Like he is punishing himself because he doesn't like what he has to do and who he has to be. And he feels like this is some strange, perverse way to make atonement for it before it happens, to make himself suffer because of all the suffering he is going to bring to the world. And I found it to be really gripping and to really manage to squeeze whatever last little bit of sympathy it was possible for me to have for Aaron, which there isn't much left that I can have for Aaron at this point, but it squeezed a little bit out when I saw that self-mutilation scene. And for me to think of that as Aaron actually punishing himself because he doesn't like the burden that's been cast upon him and he feels like he deserves this pain and this suffering. 
And then, of course, at the end, when we see the rumbling in full effect, when it hits the row of ships and just destroys them all, and it hits the harbor, and we see the colossal titans just stomping on the cannons and the artillery that are firing, we get to see Aaron in full founding titan form, and it is so creepy with that gigantic rib cage, which to me looks like the rib cage from a giant blue well, and then it's got more of a human torso in front of it, and it's got like spindly limbs like a spider, so it's the skeleton spider with this super super creepy titan face and we've seen the face close up and we've seen the rib cage from a distance but we've never gotten like this middle distance view where you really see the full creepiness of Aaron in his founding titan form and the hair has gotten so long and stringy and it really really looks like some kind of ghostly creature some kind of witch this is the appearance of a creature that would strike fear into your heart second scariest thing in this episode next to the creepy clown I found it pretty impressive we've never gotten a good look like this before the combination of a well and a spider and a witch and a skeleton and all these things coming together in a strangely uncomfortable fashion. I thought it was pretty impressive, pretty amazing, definitely sinister, the kind of thing that will strike fear into the hearts of all who see it. How is Mikasa going to look at this and still have some kind of sympathy for the Aaron that she knows is deep inside there? I don't know how that confrontation is going to come down, but I'll be eager to see it. But the episode ends simply to be continued. There's no teaser at the end. There's nothing to uh, give us a little bit of a taste of what's to come. It's simply to be continued. Uh, there was a press release that came out a little bit before I actually saw this episode that said there will be a part three to the final season. I had kind of got myself braced and built up and honestly excited for a movie. There are a lot of good arguments about why a movie wouldn't be the right choice. It'd be strange for people to go to the theater if they hadn't seen the show. The movie wouldn't make any sense to them. But I really enjoy the collective experience. I've had a good time at the Demon Slayer movie and the Jujutsu Kaisen movie. Those both work maybe a little better as a standalone. I was looking forward to a movie for selfish reasons, but we're going to get a part three. I don't know how many episodes it's going to have. I guess it's going to cover chapters 131 to 139. So how many episodes would that be? I don't know, nine or less, I guess. Uh, but how many parts are too many parts for a season? Like once we get up to part three, is it really the final season? Or it feels to me more like the final two seasons. You might even be able to argue the final three seasons. We're going to be waiting till what I'm guessing is winter season 2023 to uh, get to see the conclusion or part three to the final season. But I do feel like it will be the conclusion. Lots of speculation that they're reworking the anime ending because not everybody was happy with everything from the manga ending. So I guess we'll wait to see what happens there. So I've got another year to speculate to try to create some other content. Maybe I'll go back and watch some OVAs. I got some other thoughts to do about Attack on Titan to keep my interest there for the next year. But with that, I'm just going to say I'm proud of you for watching anime and I'll talk to you again soon. I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. It really means a lot to me. If you might be interested in Patreon perks like early access to videos, uncut reaction videos, ad-free videos, and the opportunity to vote on which anime will be covered in the future, then click on the link in the video description. Thank you.